Whenever I was 18 years old, I spent a month in the city of Osaka working at a small hostel in a residential area. And with as much free time as I had, I eventually got into street photography because I brought my family's camera with me. And honestly, I didn't have much to do at my job. So before I left Japan, I made sure to go check out a few different bookstores and buy a photo book as a souvenir. And that photo book ended up being Herbie Yamaguchi's Daikanyama 17. And after I got back from Japan, my suitcase kind of stood in my room intact for a few months before I finally got around to unpacking it completely. And upon unpacking it, I found the photo book and I looked through it. And I immediately fell in love with the place and the people that inhabited Daikanyama 17. It's kind of hard to describe Daikanyama 17 and why I think it's such an interesting place with just words. It's this tiny part of Tokyo that's completely covered in greenery. While technically just a complex of apartments, it seems like something much more. The people that live here and inhabit the streets are diverse. There are artists, eccentrics, but also high schoolers, children, and elderly people. It has the aesthetic of an independent community where people are not implicated excessively in bureaucracy and hierarchy. Yamaguchi's book inspires my mind to imagine a community with no makeup that functions solely on empathy. But how did this space come to be? After all, Rome wasn't built in a day and neither are strong communities. In 1923, a magnitude 8.0 earthquake struck the Tokyo metro area. The quake and the fires that followed killed more than 140,000 and injured significantly more. There was also at least one fire tornado that is believed to have killed 38,000 people single-handedly. The loss of 60% of Tokyo's buildings displaced 3 million, a large portion of Greater Tokyo's population of 7 million. In the months after, while the dust was still settling, the Dojunkai Corporation was established. Translated as Mutual Aid Corporation, or Corporation of Equal Benefits in English, its purpose was to construct housing for victims of the quake. And from 1925 to 1934, that's exactly what they did. The Dojunkai architects used new architectural techniques and did several tests on concrete to determine if it was suitably earthquake-proof. They imported the ideas of European modernists, such as Le Corbusier and Gropius, who believed that form should be an expression of function. They also applied traditional Japanese ideas to the designs. For example, they included a genkan, which is the reception space at the entrance to a house, which functionally serves as a place for one to take off their shoes, but symbolically represents the entrance and exit from the outside world. Some complexes also included public Japanese baths, cafes, restaurants, shops, music and drawing rooms, and lounges for socializing. In addition to all of this, the complexes included communal areas for cooking and clothes washing. Watching through old NHK docs and looking at news articles, it seems that the people living in the Dojunkai apartment blocks enjoyed a strong sense of community. I find this really unsurprising considering the history and design of the apartments. Former residents talk about how they used communal space on the roof for barbecues, and about their connections with neighbors, who many of them still communicate with. I know some people value privacy above all, and I sympathize, but I do think sharing communal space leads to more happiness. Anecdotally, I never made friends while solo traveling and staying in a hotel. On the other hand, making friends with hostile roommates has led to some of the more gratifying experiences in my life like exploring Medellin, Colombia, with a new group of friends, all from different places, or just hanging out and talking to people that I might not have otherwise talked to at a restaurant. That's just an imperfect analogy, but I do think that the truth is that strong, diverse communities are generally happier. You cannot form those if you never interact with new people outside of your home and workplace. The Dojunkai apartments miraculously survived World War II, but in 1989, the apartments in Minaroku became the first to be demolished. By 1996, a total of seven sites had been destroyed, which is when the demolition of the Daikanyama apartments began. In 2003, the Aoyama Dojunkai apartments on Amote Sando Boulevard were leveled, which were perhaps the most famous Dojunkai apartments. And finally, in 2013, the Uenoshita 
Dojunkai apartments were demolished. There are lots of blog posts and news articles online, writing about how Japanese people are especially willing to demolish old modernist buildings in favor of new modernist buildings, but that's not exactly my angle. In those articles, they're talking about famous hotels and shrines that are well upkept to the end. It would be ridiculous for me to look at this, especially as a foreigner, and caricature the redevelopment of Daikanyama 17 as uniquely Japanese. As if neighborhoods in large cities all over the United States aren't gentrifying to similar effect. The fact is that when such places exist within the borders of cities that have become more wealthy since their construction, under capitalism, they will inevitably be destroyed, and their residents will be replaced with wealthier people. It did not matter how strong, beautiful, or diverse the communities created were because they were not profitable. Large companies realized that they could make a profit redeveloping the sites, so they started to pay residents to move out, or offered them new apartments and the anonymous high-rises that were built on the site after. People slowly watched their friends and neighbors disappear until they took the money for themselves with no other option. Now, of course, you've seen in the photos that these apartments were decaying to different degrees, and that all factored into the decision to demolish them. I've omitted mentioning this until now because that is more the fault of the developer and landlords than of the tenants. Most tenants left their own apartments appearing practically brand new upon moving out. And I'll also say that tenants are actually pretty well protected by the law in Japan, or at least far better than in the United States, so the developers owning the apartments basically had to barter them out, which is better than them just getting evicted. But also, by the fact that some of the developers wanted to redevelop as early as the 1960s, that also means that they had no incentive to upkeep the apartments. Because upkeeping them basically meant making the tenants they wanted gone even harder to get rid of. Sure, in the 100 years since they were built, technology had advanced. There were particular, significant factors taken into account, and the buildings that replace the apartments are surely more comfortable and safe, but they'll never capture the same sense of community. It's not possible, not only because of the ideological differences in the construction, but also because the communities living in Dojunkais were originally brought together out of necessity, in a time of turmoil, and the ethos of mutual aid was imbued into the people and architecture over decades. On the ground where they once stood are a mix of luxury high-rises and shopping malls. The Aoyama Dojunkai on Motesando Boulevard was replaced by a large concrete and glass mall designed by Taro Ando. Once upon a time, the Aoyama Dojunkai brought a life and vibrancy to the famous shopping strip. The existence of relatively affordable housing and space on a major boulevard was something of an anomaly, according to architect John Barr, who also says the Ayama apartments formed a long stretch on the north side of Amotesando, and due to their flexible and modular layout, they provided an ideal home for the small independent businesses, galleries, startups, etc. that had colonized them over a number of years, while some of the original apartments were still being used as residences. It was this rich mix and vitality that gave Amotesando its special appeal and made it the most compelling street in Tokyo, all the more so for being in such a central location. So, my question is whether the shopping malls and luxury high-rises will meaningfully improve the quality of life of the neighborhood. Are people happier now that Daikanyama 17 fits perfectly into the white building malaise of Tokyo? At the end of Herbie Yamaguchi's book, the signs of the demolition are written on the wall. No longer are there photos of families having dinner or children playing with shopping carts in the street. There are just a few people left, and they sit in solitude. The last frame pictures the backs of a young couple running away from the camera through an empty alley of the following complex. Just before writing the conclusion of this script, I thought it might be useful to see what Herbie Yamaguchi wrote in his own conclusion. After translating it, I was surprised to see how well his photos had communicated the meaning of this book to me without saying a word. Herbie Yamaguchi writes in his 2018 updated postscript, In this book, there is a piece called Tomorrow that captures the back views of two young people running away. Two of the staff at the beauty salon, Boy Biss, that were on the site at the time are shown in this picture. I wrote this in the preface of the old version, but there were words left for me by these two people. I don't think this is the end. I need to make a new start to create a city where people can be gentle. I sympathized with the words and added the title Tomorrow to this piece. 20 years later, the town, society, and new buildings that surround us have become kinder to some people due to more advanced technology and earthquake resistance, but before the demolition, I'd felt that kindness from the buildings. 
But I wonder if that city now is still full of uplifting feelings. Also, have people's hearts become gentler than before? Just like building an infrastructure, it is important to have something that softens people's hearts and gives them positivity in each era. The Dojunkai Daikanyama apartment was completed in 1927 and demolished in 1996. As a photographer, I'm extremely honored to have completed this version of my Daikanyama 17 book with many unused cuts. While editing, I realized that I was still trying to portray this building and the people I saw there, even if there were scraps in the background. And I hope that this beauty will move people's hearts and eventually create a human-friendly society. Thank you so much for watching. This video was episode two of my series on photo books. Episode one is about Daido Moriyama and you can find it on my channel. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure to like and subscribe down below. And if you love the video, there's a few links down below that will let you buy me a coffee. And that'll help keep me going and keep the channel producing videos. So make sure to check that out. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day.